The Metis Tech Show. Welcome to the Metis Tech Show, a show for HVAC professionals by HVAC professionals. The Metis Tech Show. B2 BC. All right, Sean, so what, what's up with disc golf? Thing? Disc golf? I is hear there about, such a thing? Yeah, I guess. Really? Disc golf is big. I, I hear about it when I come out here to Atlanta. I'm We're in Atlanta oh, right I now. I can't wait to hear about by this. By the way. So disc golf is played like regular golf, except you use special Frisbees that are, are made to fly in different patterns, left turns, right turns, putters. It's big in Georgia because we have pretty good year-round weather. Okay. Ah, okay. Started in the 70s. Got really big during COVID when people needed to get outside. And it's also free. So most, oh, really? most courses are in public parks. Okay. And you just go out there with some friends, throw discs, and be outside. All right. So from what I understand of disc golf, you're throwing a disc into a chain basket. Yeah. So the basket is the, the hole. And it's about a three foot, four foot tall basket with chains, and then a, a catch basin underneath. Okay. So the the whole point is just like golf, trying to get this disc as into this basket with the least amount of throws, yep. swings. You call that pars, also? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it plays like golf, scores like golf. So you've got three par, four par, depending on the on where how far. Do you, are you, are they called baskets? Um, we call them. I mean, I call them baskets. Everybody calls it the basket or the hole. Okay. Okay. Um, Interesting. <clears throat> it's just something that's picked up in the last probably four years. People are actually making money at it as pros. Really? There's a Just like cornhole. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. Uh, one of the bigger pros just signed a $10 million 10-year contract oh, a couple wow. years ago. So that's interesting. There's actual money to be made. Wow. All right, so what happens if you swing or throw this disc into the woods? You play it as it lies? Most disc golf courses are in the woods. Okay. And so you're throwing around trees, through trees. Wondered about that. And there are some out-of-bounds, just like regular golf, water hazards, stuff like that. Fences can be out-of-bounds. But other than that, you just play it wherever you pick it up. So if it lands in the middle of a lake, you you pick a, 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 a near location you usually throw it from the the last spot that it was in bounds. Okay. So you kind of figure out where it went over the lake, and that's where I you throw it. from. Interesting. And is there nine baskets or eighteen baskets like golf? Or? Eighteen usually. There's a, there's an eighteen hole course about five minutes from here. As a matter wow. Of fact. We're gonna have to check this out. Yes. We may even have to try this for our yearly our meeting. training out outing. <laughs> right. Um, Team building. That's great stuff, Sean. Welcome to the Metis Tech Show. We have Sean Patterson. He is a technical service advisor. Sean, tell us a little bit about what you do here at Metis. Well, actually, I am now the team lead for the technical service department, or nice. te technical service advisors. Uh, so I went from troubleshooting over the phone to still troubleshooting over the phone and now developing training for the other TSAs, just helping people when they have nice. problems. Nice. And just being available, like somewhat like the supervisors when people just need help. Back them up. And back them up. Awesome. That's fantastic. We have Juan Cardona, technical hey. instructor out of Hebron <laughs> or Ohio. We call it the Ohio Training Center. You all know yes. Juan. And myself. Hello, everyone. Steve Pimentel, technical training manager for uh, Metis and instructor out of the Boston Training Center. And this is um, as, as you all know, a podcast geared towards the installation technician in the truck, the service technician. Yes. We're all important, right? doesn't matter if you're an install tech, if you're um, in service, if you're in controls, whatever you do, this podcast is geared towards you in the truck trying to get that technical information out. This episode is going to be really special because we all call tech support. Oh, yeah. And I've called tech support. I've been in the field for um, a long time as well as you, Juan. Yes. And I've call, had to call tech support with different, Several you know, times. Um, 
whether it be train, whether it be carrier, Fujitsu, nope. Samsung, Sanyo, you name it. Yep. Uh, we have, you know, I've, I've been on the phone and it's not easy as a technician to call tech support and you're trying to get this unit fixed. You're trying to get this piece of equipment fixed as fast as you can. Um, sometimes we kind of skip steps. Oh, yeah. I'm guilty of that. You oh, know, right? yeah. I could have looked in the manual. Sometimes too fast. Yes. That's so why we get in trouble. I could have, you know, gone to a manual and, and really dug in myself. But we want these answers now. Yes. We want them now. We want them quick. And we want the guy that has the answers. And that's, and that's what we call the tech support. And that's Sean, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> So we have residential equipment, we have commercial equipment, and what would you say is your specialty in in being in tech support? Is it commercial? Is it residential? I spent the most time on residential before I switched over to commercial, and so I feel super comfortable with the residential stuff. I'm comfortable with the commercial and the controls, but residential is sort of where I like to live. Nice. Right. It's, so let's say I'm a contractor. I'm in the field. I'm working on this unit. I can't figure out what the problem is. Uh, let us know what process I should take, uh, be perhaps before even calling tech support. What should I be doing? I mean, with the first thing I would do is go to my link drive, download the service manual. There are some troubleshooting guides in the tech tip section on my link drive as well that might lead you to a solution. But really, before calling in, check the basics. Does it have power? Does okay. it have an error code? Does it have refrigerant in the system? You know, the stuff that people sort of panic about when they see a mini split that they wouldn't panic about if they were dealing with a unitary fixed speed air conditioner. Right. A single right. pole contactor unit is exactly. what I call them. <laughs> yeah. So, what would explain to us? I have kind of an idea of how the tiers work here at Metis, um, as far as when someone picks up the phone and calls that 1-800 number, who's answering that phone? So the first place they're going to go is customer care. Um, also, we refer to them as tier one or customer care. Just doesn't really matter. They get all the basic information. Contractor name, company, model and serial number, the equipment, and any kind of error codes or problems that they're having. They will do some light troubleshooting to see if they can resolve it without creating a case. And if they can, then it's just, that's the end of it. If not, they escalate it to tier two based on whether it's controls call, an M&P, residential call, commercial, et cetera. Okay. And basic tests includes the, um, the voltage testing. Make sure you've got two hot legs and not one. That you have communication across S1, S2, and S3, or S2 and S3. And then all that that basic stuff is what you're referring to. Yeah, they'll do the basic stuff like that, and then if it starts to get weird or everything looks completely abnormal, they'll they'll escalate it to tier two. Okay, so if a contractor calls up, well, let's say a homeowner calls up, calls that one eight hundred number and says, "I'm trying to use my handheld remote controller, and I don't know if I'm looking at the little sun symbol or the snowflake symbol." <laughs> <laughs> on this remote yeah. controller. So tier one, they're going to kind of, they, they have the capability of taking care of that. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. and the homeowner calls, with the exception of Kumo product, never come back to tier two. So homeowners are completely tier one, customer care resolved, or they tell them that they need a, a contractor on site. Right. Smart. Okay. Yeah. You know, you touch that point with the sun and, and, the, and, and the snow. <laughs> Yes. To me, uh, to me, that was always the opposite. The sun to me meant heat. The snow always meant cold. <laughs> yeah, and but, and but thankfully that has been changed. Yes, and with the new uh, new line of uh, M series systems with the remote controller, thank God they they changed that to actual heat text. Yeah, cool, and it's written right on the remote. There's no symbol anymore, so that's really important. And we mentioned that my link drive. Dot com is where they should start. Um, for, so, yes, for Mitsubishi product. Yep. For train, it's train.mylinkdrive.com. Ah, okay, very important, Standard yeah. It is americanstandard.mylinkdrive.com. Okay. You cannot cross-search model numbers on those websites. So if it's a train, they have to go to train.mylink. Yep. Yeah, because the model numbers the are, are really different. For instance, like the MXZ, correct me if I'm wrong, is now an NXT. Yes. Something to that effect. Something, something to that like that, yeah. yes. 
Yeah. So we'll something we had to out. all get used to, right? <laughs> right. Um, as uh, Mitsubishi employees, we had to get used to the nomenclature, how it changed over uh, for, for train for American Standard, right? Um, so, so we talked about what the contractor should do before calling tech support. Um, we, we talked about the different tiers. Um, once it and real quick, once that call needs more um, more attention, let's say uh, more support, something that we need somebody out boots on the ground, somebody out on on site. Where does that go? If they need boots on the ground, site visits, we escalate to the area service managers and also tell the techs to contract their local DSG. And okay, yeah. By tagging the area service manager, they will also contact the local DSG to try to get them from communication from both sides to get somebody on the job site before the ASM has to go out there. Right. And the DSG is someone that provides, uh, that's been hired by the supplier, the distributor, to provide technical support to their customers from that distributor. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah, so that, that DSG not only um, does technical support over the phone, but they're also ready to go and do a site visit. Site visits. Uh, and, and work with the contractor to try and resolve the, the issue uh, on the piece of equipment they purchased from that distributor. Um, and that's important. And then it gets escalated to the area service manager that works for Metis, um, and then from there, we have something called the Tiger Team. So I've been told um, someone used it uh, an example of what they do. Um, they, they, they're there to pick the fleas out of the pepper, <laughs> right? They get down to the nitty gritty, <laughs> right? Um, so is that correct, Sean? Yeah, if the Tiger Team is going out, things are really broken or or really strange. Okay. Yeah, yeah so they're, they're resolving uh, possible compressor issues something where the refrigerant flow is just not doing what it's supposed to do and they have to hook up some some devices some tools meters to that piece of equipment and really start digging into why this system's not performing the way it should right and they're usually assisting area service managers when they're on the job site and then if it's a long-term problem they yeah they, appear, they come to get the on site. a plane and, and show up. So at that point, yeah. that's that's a major issue um, when Tiger Team gets involved. And Tiger Team, there's about um, I want to say four or five members of the Tiger Team. We're gonna have an episode <laughs> down the line where we get some Tiger Team. That'll be good for someone from Tiger Team on there um, on here to talk about what they do, and, and it's really interesting. So the process really should be first my link drive. Because anything you ever, depending on the brand, of course, and you've mentioned that, if it's uh, Mitsubishi, uh, mylinkdrive.com, uh, because anything you wanted to know about Mitsubishi products is found there. So from there, you would go to the DSG, uh, which is the local tech support guy from the distributor. And then from there, um, tech support or even have the DSG reach out. The DSG can reach out to the area service manager Correct. without even getting us involved. Right. And I do want to say about MyLink Drive, it is actually the, the tool that we use. We don't have any special documents that we use for troubleshooting. Everything that we use is just in the same service manuals that are available to people online. We just start in go. them more so we know where everything is. Right. And when I started, I just want to mention something. When I started here um, uh, almost six years ago, I, I went through something called onboarding. And okay. so, which most of us went through, right? And I got, came out here to Atlanta, and this is where you tech support lives. They live in Atlanta, right? And that's where the tech tech support department is. Um, one of the or two of the days that I was here that week, I had the chance to sit with tech support and actually put a put a headset on and sit in and listen to one of their some calls, of the calls, which was so good to listen to. Yes. Um, and, and I heard some of the some of the pains and struggles that the 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 the, the, co the, con the contractor had calling in, uh, hearing him running up and down steps, running back outside to flip a disconnect on. Uh, you know, the, there's a lot going on. He's yeah. on the phone. He's trying to get the most he can out of that phone call, um, which which leads me to then my next question for you, Sean. What what would be the top five most common 
tech support calls that you get? Not ranked in any order, but I would say the top two are communication issues. Okay. And addressing of residential branch box systems. Okay. Followed by additional charge on residential branch box systems and Pumis. Then it just kind of runs the gamut of wiring issues, expansion valve problems, that kind of stuff. But it's really just the top three are. Yeah. Yeah. And, and those communication, let's start with the communication issues. I would think those are brand new installs. Mo- most of the time, mm, am I incorrect in saying that? 70, 30 existing okay. uh, over new installs. Usually when people mess them up on install, they realize they've got the wires swapped. But on existing stuff, it's a little trickier because it's been running for five years. Why is it a problem with the wires not happening now? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that can be anything from condensate pump, uh, maybe breaking S1 or... Condensate uh, pumps, mouse chewed wires. Okay. Yeah. Which it should be covered in the basics. Only if you can see the wire. Sure. Now, yeah. our, our circuit boards never go bad, right? Is that it's true? <laughs> I'm sorry. I was going to say it's always the board, but it's, hard, it's hardly yeah. ever the board. Although what it I, does happen. Yes. What I share in my classes is Mitsubishi does not break. People <laughs> break Mitsubishi. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so we're, we're going to have... We're going to have bad boards out there. Oh, it's it's going to happen. You know, um, you could have electrical uh, issues, um, you know, affecting, causing communication faults, right? You can. Um, more often than not, it's a wire problem than a board problem. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, How is it a wire problem? Let us know more about that. What about the wire? So if you have a low-grade short between S1 and S3 you'll read very high DC voltage. Okay. Uh, and, you know, with the wires disconnected, you'll be at 70 or 80 volts instead of 26. Okay. And so if you have 26 outside and 70 inside... It's a wire problem. There's a wire problem. Okay. Or if you have 26 outside and zero inside... It's a wire problem. It's a wire problem or there's a pump that they didn't tell us about between. That's, that's wired somewhere in a Or a switch. Place. Or a switch. Yeah. And then... Or a splice... We don't talk about sports. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so so that that would be probably one of the you said one of the top two communication faults. Next being let's talk about addressing issues. So on the residential side, the the only addressing issues that we're dealing with are, is on the smart multi system. We had a podcast episode on addressing, right? So on the on the smart multi system, we have a branch box, we have uh, up to eight indoor units that can be connected this is going to change soon depending with the on larger, the size of the outdoor unit larger smart multis that are on, on their way in i should say but we're basically setting an address on the branch box and the address of the outdoor unit is 50 plus that um, now what happens if the contractor just doesn't address anything and flips the disconnect on will it work for a while maybe until it doesn't until it doesn't so we've seen them work for years and then there's a power outage or somebody turns that disconnect off, and then it just quits working. It doesn't find anything. Okay. Or right out of the gate, it doesn't work. It really is sort of a coin toss on whether it's going to work because they wow. will kind of self-address. Yeah, because I had a right. student in class tell me, well, I never address my smart multis. I didn't know I had to. And it runs. Sure. And I'm until like, it does. well, until it until doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> so, um, and he was like, really? Maybe that explains why I'm going back to some of these systems to and that's how we teach we teach to manually address them instead of allowing the uh the auto address feature which it it's there but like you just said you have a power interruption that can just go out by the wayside oh sure we've seen them where three indoor units have been working for two years and then all of a sudden one of them just doesn't get recognized anymore and all you have to do is address it and flip a dip switch and everything's working again and it's done awesome so communication faults, addressing additional charge. Additional charge, yes. The, um, the additional charge chart in the installation manual can be confusing. Yeah. You know, when you get to the box, it first of all it's all in metric. There are no standard sizes. You know, no quarter, no three eighths. It's all six point two five millimeter and whatever the other one is, and then the box that talks about the capacity of indoor units everybody skips because they don't mm-hmm. they either don't know what it means or they think they have to say i've got three two-ton indoor units so i need to add that less than twenty-seven thousand figure three times yeah 
And and I'm sure you've gotten plenty of calls where, um, and let's use a smart multi as as an example, brand new smart multi, and they open the valves. Didn't add anything. They didn't know they had to, and they opened the valves and fired it up, and now it's undercharged. Um, remember, with a smart multi, you always have to add refrigerant. It doesn't matter if it's a foot of line set or 400 feet of line set. You're always adding yep. something. So unlike the one-to-one -one M series units, how can we figure out the charge on those? Look at the data plate on the side of the unit. Yes, look at the plate. And Which is good for a certain length of line set. And then there's a chart in the service man or the installation manual that tells you for the any additional. And it's also on the data plate on most of them. It'll tell you good for the additional you know, for 98 feet, and then it's 1.08 ounces per additional there you go. five feet. Right. So then we even have to look it up. Yep. So when we get into the smart multi line uh, on the residential side, smart multi is basically a city multi system. So at that point, smart multi into the larger a city multi or commercial systems, we're basically just looking at liquid line length times a, a given multiplier Fire. that's in the install manual, and then going from there and adding adding up all the connected capacity um, of the indoor units, which is the last piece of the puzzle, like Sean just mentioned, that yep. a lot of people don't pay attention to that, that part of it, and then they miss that uh, connected capacity. Once we get into City Multi, really, we should be using Diamond System Builder Absolutely. software. I will uh, say, actually, with Smart Multi, we should be using Diamond System Builder yeah. software because on the older MXZ branch box systems, an MXZ 4C36 could take four indoor units. A 5C42 could take five. five. Yeah. The Smart Multi took that nomenclature off. And so we literally had a call last week where I had five indoor units on a three-ton which can only take four, but there's nothing in the, the nomenclature that says it anymore. Okay. So if he'd yeah. have put it in a diamond system builder, he would have found out. He would have found that as soon as he tried to add the fifth unit, it would have kicked him out. Yeah. So for those of you that never heard of Diamond System Builder, it's free software uh, available on mylinkdrive.com. You go to the software tab, download Diamond System Builder. It's going to allow you to build a work. Well, a one-to-one -one or multi-zone system, either residential or commercial, and lay out all of all of the pipe sizes. The you can enter in your pipe lengths, your heights, because basically, Diamond System Builder is looking at two major things when you're building that system out. It's um, your pipe, your your maximum pipe lengths not exceeding that, and your vertical separation. Yep. Right, those are the important things, um, and then at the end of it, it tells you how much refrigerant to add. Right, so and what I like about it is it doesn't let you make a mistake. Yes, it's going to red flag you, it. right? And yeah. so if, if you connect, um, try and connect pieces of equipment that don't match, or you exceed a line set, maybe um, your branch run is limited to, uh, let's say, eighty-two feet, and you have eighty-two feet and six elbows. Right, so we know elbows add length to the pipe. It's going to red flag you and say, "Hey, you've just gone over." Right, and you got to rework your your uh, installation a little bit. Uh, but yeah, Diamond System Builder gets overlooked on the residential side quite a bit, but not anymore. And I'm going to mention something that's really important. We're we're releasing our IntelliHeat cased A coil. Yep. Now the <laughs> IntelliHeat cased A coil is. Definitely has some line length restrictions. It has some refrigerant restrictions on it. If you're going to build um, a, a system, or mul especially a multi zone system with PAA, IntelliHeat a -co K State coils, run it through Diamond System Builder. First. Yes. Before um, you even order the equipment. Yes. And make sure you got all the compatible, um, you know, where is the outdoor unit in reference to the, to the case coil? Am I going to stay within that minimum? Uh, we're going to have some episodes coming up on the IntelliHeat yes. to work out some of these um, these important points in installing the equipment. But Diamond System Builder is so important. So we so we talked about communication issues. We talked about addressing additional refrigerant. What's number four? Number four is usually wiring questions. You know, how do you wire the MNet for a branch box system? Can I power my branch box off the outdoor unit if I have all these indoor units without separate power supplies? So that's wiring in general is a question because everybody wants to, not everybody, 
a lot of people want to go outside the installation parameters. Yeah. Yeah. And say, hey, can I run an eight gauge wire for this one and a half ton one to one? Right. And the answer is no. You know, so more of the questions are about can I get around the rules? Yeah. Then and the answer is no. we can't. No, the answer is we <laughs> cannot guarantee operation yeah. if you go outside of our parameters. Yes. Right. And they should be going to the installation manual for wire size um, and wiring best practices. Um, yeah. So ba then when we talk about 16 two stranded shielded communication wire on the smart multi, uh, we're basically daisy chaining or running that wire from the outdoor unit to the branch box and daisy chaining it to a second branch box if need be. But there, there's only one wire that works that's for it. the control wire, and that's the 16 two stranded shielded wire. Uh, when we get into city multi commercial, we're doing a lot of yeah, daisy lot chaining. Of Same thing. Installation manual tells you your your wire length restrictions, your wire type, and we've I've seen I've been on job sites where they've ran thermostat wire for the the twenty nine volt M net wire and it doesn't it, it again it's one of those things where will it work? Yes, until it doesn't, and that's a callback. I've yep. been on job sites where they ran thermostat wire for S one S two S three. Ooh, wow! Ouch. And since it was yeah. too small, they just doubled it up. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> it's running. Yeah. It's been like that for years. <laughs> so again, this goes back to the be where we talked about right at the beginning of this episode, what should technicians be doing before they call tech support? Make sure you got all, all your ducks in a row and make sure you looked at the installation manual. You have the right wire size, the right length of pipe. You're not exceeding pipe restrictions. You're not exceeding vertical separation. And then... Those are those are top four. Can you name a a fifth? <laughs> <laughs> it's that word nobody wants to say. Uh, Kumo is probably our fifth. Yes, most popular call. Yeah. So the IT side of HVAC is part of our lives now, right? IT is every. It's in. It's in boilers now. It's in furnaces. It's in. Yep. Um, every every everything's going Wi-Fi. Rice cookers and air fryers. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. So this there's a hurdle there for a lot of contractors, especially the the uh, the old timers like myself, um, where they have to go into someone's house and start connecting uh, Wi-Fi devices, HVAC Wi-Fi devices. And I, I think it is. I, I was a tech for twenty years, and the the hurdle is, I'm an air conditioning guy, I'm not an IT guy, mm -hmm. and so whenever people see Wi-Fi thermostats, whether they're Kumo or Honeywell or Ecobee Nest. They just go, here it is. You get it connected to the internet. My boss says we're not supposed to do it. And and that's just sort of the trend. Yeah. Well, with guys like me that are over fifty. Yeah. Like yeah. like us. Like well, I, <laughs> I wasn't gonna speak for you guys. Um, <laughs> the younger guys are more comfortable with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Because they've got the Bluetooth gauges that connect to their phone, and yep. like they're already all about the tech. It's Kumo's a struggle sometimes, just because you're dealing with a consumer giving a technician information that may or may not be correct. Passwords. Passwords. Username. Network stuff, IDs. Yeah. Yep. And then Kumo Station scares everybody for some reason, even though it's just a relay box. Yeah. yeah, and you can listen to episode two with Ed Babiars where we really get into Kumo Cloud and some of the struggles. Um, there is a major update to Kumo Cloud coming out um, very soon that is going to enhance a lot of the layout on the app and how things look, tiles, different things. So always making improvements to Kumo Cloud, and hopefully that cuts down on your calls into tech support, some of those, some of those issues. I, I think it will. I mean, I think really the hardest... Like I said earlier, the only consumer calls we will take in Tier 2 is Kumo calls. And there are a lot of homeowners that call in that say, my installer put this in and then gave me your phone number. Oh, All wow. Right. Interesting. And I'd actually almost rather deal with the homeowner because they know their Wi-Fi right. password. Usually. Right. So so what are the, some of the tools that a contractor should have on in hand when he calls tech support and gets you on the phone? What are you looking for them to have ready to go? Uh, meter. That's AC volts, DC volts, up to 600 volts on each because a lot of meters stop at 20 volts of DC. I don't know mm -hmm. why. Basic hand tools, gauges, the equipment open and ready to be worked on. You know, we One of our biggest complaints from techs, and I'm going to go off the range a little bit here, yeah, yeah. is the hold time. Well, if I have to wait for a technician to 
get to the roof, find the right unit, turn off the power, pull off all the covers, you're five, ten minutes waiting for somebody to get if that you're done. Lucky, depending on the building or the access. And that adds ten minutes to someone else's hold time. Yep. And yeah. so if they're ready to actually work on the equipment, it saves a ton of time. Calls get moved through at a more reasonable rate. I wouldn't say quicker, but I mean, just the same basic hand tools you would work with on a regular furnace. You know, just a meter capable of, like I said, DC volts and high resistance readings. You know, a lot of the less expensive meters will only go to 900 ohms. Yeah. We have nothing that ohms that out under low. 900 ohms except for a compressor right. and a fan motor. So you should have a meter at least one that will measure up to one meg, if not more. Ideally, yeah. yeah. Or at least 500K. What okay. about automatic sensing volt DC and AC voltage setting on a meter? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's the short answer. Yeah. Um, the, and the reason, no, is when you're dealing with S2, S3 communication, we're dealing with DC voltage over high voltage power lines, AC power lines. So the, the auto DC meters will just keep flipping back and forth. 157, 200, 3. And then if they put it in the regular DC range, if they have it, then we can get regular correct readings. But the auto meters just do not do well with uh, DC over AC power lines. Yeah. yeah. I, I explain that to students all the time. We had a, actually had a batch of meters when I first started training, and these meters would kind of get very confused when you had them across S2 and S3 uh, trying to get that bouncing voltage, DC voltage, and you had that automatic setting it's going to determine whether it sees AC and DC. Well, that meter didn't know what to do because it's you're seeing a basically AC and DC on on S3. one wire. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's. Um, I'm yeah. glad you brought. What about needle leads? Needle leads are critical for ohming out pretty much anything but a compressor. Yeah, because what if I call you, Sean, and I say, um, oh, you know, I'm trying to diagnose this fan motor, and I got my needle, my. Uh, my meter leads, not needle leads, but my meter, standard meter leads across pins one and four, and you're saying, well, you should have um, 300 volts there. And I say, well, I don't. Are you, you're going to start losing faith in me real quick, and if I don't have those needle leads actually making contact with it, those. If you're, I mean, it's like any other leads. If you're not making contact, you're not going to read. On, on the non-voltage stuff, we can kind of get around it with, I mean, I've used safety pins, Paper clips. Paper clips. Yeah. <laughs> Staples. <laughs> Had one guy literally cutting bristles out of his wire brush to stick down Just in there. Just wow. Yeah. Uh, thermostat wire, but I wouldn't do it on a 300 volt circuit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, so get yourself a good set of needle leads. They 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 sell all different types. They they're on Amazon. Um, they, they they can be as inexpensive as ten bucks for a set of needle leads, yeah. all the way to one hundred and fifty dollars for a set of Fluke uh, precision needle leads that are retractable. So that makes a big yeah, difference. Yeah, and I've seen a lot of the younger techs uh, that are thrown in the truck and then thrown in the field and <laughs> told to fix it with no training. They'll go into a connector with the regular leads, and they're breaking the connector and maybe buying a new wiring harness or maybe even a new board because they did not have the, rob the proper tools. Yeah. Yeah, and we deal with the tech that's been thrown in the truck and pointed in a direction a lot, and I actually prefer that. Because they'll tell you right out the gate, they have no idea what they're doing. So you can just go, oh, perfect. Do this. There you go. But I would say needle leads, maybe some alligator clip leads for checking compressors. Yep. Just yep. for safety. Yeah. And yeah. then it's just your regular heating and air tools. Okay. Yeah. And no adapters needed for the refrigerant lines. Yeah. So thermometers. That's, that's a plus. Thermometers. <laughs> maybe you want to check. And Sean's going to have you check Delta T. Um, across the unit and maybe having a good thermometer, not so much uh, a, 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 an infrared thermometer. Yeah, no. Right? The infrared thermometers have a purpose, but they read surface temp. We I've, want to read I've been air to temp. Many, I've, to, I've been to many side visits when a technician brings out a laser type or yeah. uh, infrared. Yeah. said, so, no. <laughs> and I can't remember who makes it, but there was a guy I talked to about a month ago that had an infrared that also had a type K thermocouple on it. Okay. So he's like, let me put away the laser and just pull out the thermocouple. I was like, thank you. Who makes that? And I can't remember who it was, but it was kind of nice because you could do surface or air with it. 
Awesome. One thing you alluded to earlier that I want to ask for the um, benefit of the field, of the people out there that don't understand or don't know, you alluded to the whole time. Okay. On a, on a busy day, how many calls do you guys get in one day? On a busy, well, I can tell you our average right now, we have 14 people on the phones. Okay. And this is it's sort of a steady time, not really a busy time. We're between 200 and 275 calls a day. Wow. July, oh. we, I've, we've seen six, 700. And, you know, since we cover all the U.S., Hawaii, Alaska, the U.S. Caribbean islands, people are calling all day. And... In the middle of the summer, you might not get a call back till tomorrow, but you will always get a call back. Yeah. You just might not be at the job site, so make sure you do some testing, write down some numbers so that somebody can try to help you out without you without forcing you to go back. Right. So if I call you, Sean, and I say, uh, or you call me back, and I say, well, I'm 20 miles away from the job, can you still help me, though, if I give you this information or tell you what, exactly what I seen when I was there on on the job? Oh, absolutely. I'd yeah. prefer that because then I can give you things to check when you go back. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to sort of break off on this. When a tech calls in, they're asked to give an email address. Most techs don't want to give out an email address. I don't know why. But when you have a case created, if the person handling your case changes the state, you will get an email that says, if you need further assistance, click this link and we'll schedule a callback. That's what I was going to get into. And that callback takes priority over everyone else in the there queue. There you go. At oh, that see, time. that's good stuff. And I used that yeah. when I was a contractor. I learned that one of the, the callback thing people, is yes, I set amazing. up a time and then I was there ready and able for the tech support person to call me. And your phone rang at nine o'clock. Absolutely. Just remember, and it says it on the, the callback site, all calls Eastern time. Yeah. So yeah. if you're in California, I've already had a guy set up one for eight in the morning. I called him at five. Thankfully, he was go. at the gym. Yeah. So getting back to most important tools, having the the right tools before they they call you, Sean. You had a meter, um, set of gauges, temperature tools, possibly, and there are a multitude of tools out in the market now uh, that make the make it so much easier for the HVAC technician compared to what I had when I was in, in a service truck 20 years ago. There's just been so much technology coming out. Now we have different apps that we can use that help the technician. But as far as getting back to the tool part of it, the the gauges, we're not always going to just put a ga set of gauges on, on an outdoor unit unless a, a refrigerant issue is suspected or a compressor issue. Now, once it goes to you, and I can sit here as an instructor, and, and Juan can relate to this. We say, no gauges. Don't right. put gauges on our units and blah, blah, blah. But when let's get you know down to reality here. When a call goes to Sean, Sean's at that point where he's telling a customer, um, a contractor, put those gauges on. We need to see what the pressures are. At that point, you're dealing with just a not just a regular air conditioner with variable speed, but it's still an air conditioner. So if you're doing maintenance and everything is working great, Use the gauges. gauges in the truck. Right. Use temperature clamps. Yeah. But if you suspect a refrigeration problem, hook up gauges just like you would on a regular yeah. air conditioner or heat pump because if it's empty, it's empty. doesn't matter whose it is. It's not going to work. Right. right. All right. Awesome. So, I mean, the, the best way to check performance without a set of gauges is Delta T. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, you know, and people, they see the slide that says, please don't hook up gauges, and they miss the part that says, unless you suspect there's a problem. Right. All right. So... Sean, tell us what what do you like most about your job? Well, what what is what is what is a good day in the tech support department? Man, that's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the phone doesn't ring. I'll answer that for you. Uh, <laughs> actually, no. That when the phone doesn't ring, I get bored. Yeah, this is the pizza guy calling you. Up. Where, where are you? I need to bring you some pizza. <laughs> so, I I did residential and light commercial heating and air for twenty years okay. in in Atlanta. So a good day means I'm not in an attic, not in a crawl space. But I still get to use my brain and help people fix things. You know, that yeah. was the most satisfying thing about being a heating and air guy in the field is the customer's happy when you're done because mm -hmm. the air conditioning's blowing again. Right. Most techs don't call in until they're frustrated, so they're already kind of angry. And if you can get them calm, get them working, get them happy, everybody's having a slightly better day. Awesome. That's yeah. great. 
And and what what's a what's a what's a real what's a bad day for you? In... <laughs> <laughs> Because we all have those bad days. It's let's be honest. Bad days usually start with a bad call, and yeah. whether that's a combative person on the other end of the phone, or just a problem we can't get resolved because they're getting kicked out of the building, or they can't take the phone into the building because they're in a government building, and then it just kind of goes downhill from there. Right. You know, the, the calls that you can't fix. Yeah. Create a bad day for me. Yeah. yeah especially we're calling you for help. We should let you help us, right? But when when the guy on when, yeah. when the guy on our end of the phone goes, you know, honestly, I don't know either. <laughs> yeah, it, it yeah, doesn't make them feel very great. So yeah, non resolution makes for a a not great day. All right. Yeah. Well, this is great stuff, Sean. I, I'm so glad we had you on today. This is going to kind of bring some insight to the service tech, the installer out in the field, the whoever is calling tech support, now they can understand your side of things and Absolutely. how things how things work on the tech support side. At the bottom line, Sean's here to help you. Uh, his whole team, they're here to help you resolve the problem as quick as possible. And be prepared. I yeah. mean, you've got tools that you can access before you even making the phone call. Yeah. So just be prepared, and I'm sure anyone in tech support would appreciate your effort in doing so, and then they'll be more than willing to help. Yeah, my favorite tech is the one that says, I've done this, 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 and this, and now I'm stumped. Uh, and I go, cool. We'll take those five things out of the there equation, you go. and we'll get into the weird stuff. Nice. I like that. Yeah. So, so Sean, thanks for being on today. If anybody needs more information on any Mitsubishi products, please visit MitsubishiComfort.com. If you're interested in signing up for training, same place, MitsubishiComfort.com. Go to Four Professionals, click on Four Pros, and click on Training, and you'll be on our training page, and you'll be able to see all of our classes that we offer, residential, commercial, controls, you name it, yep. um, and a lot of new classes that are being added to the learning management system. Also, MyLinkDrive.com. That's where you get all your installation manuals, service manuals, tech tip videos, app notes, just a ton of information. Sean's on MyLinkDrive.com when you call him. If you're both on MyLinkDrive.com, when you're on that phone call, it makes it much easier to get through that, that, problem, that call. Absolutely. Um, and you could, you'll find that you'll be able to resolve a lot of the calls before you have to call tech support by going to MyLinkDrive.com. Again, Sean, thank you for being on. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for having us. All right. We'll see you on the next one. Hasta la vista. Adios. Adios.